Well, welcome back. Thank you, sister. Appreciate the great music. We just sang a song, Praise to the Lord, the King of Creation. Does anybody know who that song was written by? No, good guess. Isaac Watts. A German fella named Joachim Neander. And in the, the valley that was named after him, the German word for valley is Tal or Thal, in the valley that was named after him, Neander Thal, Neander's Valley, they found some skeletons and called them Neanderthal men. We'll be learning more about that tomorrow. Well, we're halfway through our creation investigation, and we're going to learn tonight about some missing links in evolution. I'm going to warn you in advance of this session that this is my most technical session. I always kind of like getting a little bit deep in one session in case there's some evolutionists in the crowd that are like, wow, you never addressed the real issues of evolution. So I'm going to go a little deep, but I understand from Pastor this is an extraordinarily sharp, well-educated, and now well-fed <laughs> audience. So we're going to have to resist the urge to kind of zone out after that great meal. By the way, who brought food? All you ladies, guys too, I don't want to be gender specific, that brought food. Thank you. That is, was wonderful. What a great meal. Appreciate it so much. What a, what a wonderful time. Well, let's talk about missing links. Now, when I say missing links, I don't mean like this Kawasaki, half cow and half motorcycle, a redneck motorcycle. Uh, I'm talking about missing links in the, the logic stream, missing links in the theory. Uh, and uh, we're going to begin to talk now about these two models. So I ended last presentation by saying the way I would prefer to see things presented in the public school would be to have two models. And you might have, at the end of last session, make, well, what are the two models? Here they are. From now on, tonight and tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about the two models. So on the creation model, we have origin by design. Origin by design. That is abrupt appearance. They were designed. Over against that, we have a naturalistic origin where things have to just happen slowly and gradually through happen chance mutations that then can become selected by natural selection, which then get uh, you know, distributed in the population. And, and so it takes great eons, but just by natural law and by happen chance, you have natural origin. On the creation model, our second main point would be decreasing order. That is, God created things good, and they have degenerated. Over against that, we have increasing order. You have to get from molecules to man over the course of some millions or billions of years. Th th there's no other choice about it. You can't start with a man you got, you know, coming out of thin air. You have to start with molecules that you work your way up. <clears throat> and then we have catastrophism, various versus uniform gradualism. Now, we talked a little bit about that in last session, but what I want to do is right now in this session is hone in on point number one. For Sunday morning service, I'll hone in on point number two, and for Sunday night service, I'll hone in on point number three. We'll talk about the geology, catastrophism versus gradualism. Does that make sense? Those are, those are two models right there. Okay, biblically, <clears throat> we're going to look at 1 Peter 3.3. 1 Peter 3.3, 3, the Apostle Peter says, Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. <clears throat> scoffers, walking after their lust. What's a scoffer? Somebody tell me. Hmm? Somebody that mocks, okay. We have a more current word that we might use, a skeptic. Ah, that's not true. I don't know. I doubt you on that. And, you know, they're just skeptics. Do we have those out there today? Oh, yes. There are lots of them, right? And so the last days is going to come the skeptics. I, I was uh, having a debate with a fellow uh, who's an atheist from Kentucky, and uh, I said, you occupy an important part in fulfilled prophecy. Well, he got real offended at that. I said, no, the Bible talks about you coming in the last days. And the Bible even says what you're going to say. It says, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That doesn't mean they believe in creation. This just means it's, it's continued since the origin, very consistent. 
What philosophy is that right there? We talked about it. Uniformitarianism, uniform gradualism, consistency, the present is the key to the past, right? And so this whole idea is predicted in Scripture. The rise of the modern skeptics is predicted. Not only that, but Peter gives in verses 5 and 6 how we can answer them. And I don't want to dwell too much on this because I'm going to go into this tomorrow. But it says, you answer them by understanding the watery conditions of the early earth and you, understand, you, you answer them through the Genesis flood. That's how you answer them. Verses 5 to 6. And so we'll talk about that tomorrow. But here's what we're going to talk about today. Let's, or tonight. The evolutionists' arguments. I'm going to give you Honest to God, as best as I can, their best arguments, right out of their mouth. And then we want to talk and answer them, and then I talk briefly about biological complexity and mechanism challenges. The biggie will be the first one, the next two will go pretty quick. Okay, so let's give you their best arguments. Now, we define evolution as molecules to man transformation, but understand that there are lots of little splinter pieces to evolution. When some people talk about evolution, they think about cosmic evolution. That is, the evolution of matter and energy in the universe, or the Big Bang. <clears throat> Others think about stellar evolution, the origin of stars and planets. How do we get that? Uh, you know, the astrophysicists, they think about this kind of thing. And then chemical evolution. So once you have the Earth, okay, forming, because all that's coming out of the Big Bang is just hydrogen. How do you get all these wonderful little elements that we have here that are necessary for life, okay? The chemical evolution. And then once you've got the earth cooling enough that you have liquid water, the origin of life, where you get water and rocks and the chemicals come together somehow and make the first primitive life form, origin of life. And then you have macroevolution. That is, once you get that, how do you get new kinds of creatures that eventually you get from molecules to man, right? And then microevolution, that is, within the different kinds, variation. So we have various kinds of rabbits and various kinds of people, and some people are tall, some people are short, some people have dark skin, some have light skin. Now, of all that, only one has ever been observed. What is it? The last one. All the rest of that is speculative. That's important. It's not hard science. You cannot take me to a laboratory or anywhere in the field and show me a Big Bang happening. Or a star evolving, like just out of dust coming together and igniting. That doesn't happen. It's all theory that people have. Okay? So the only one that's ever been observed is the last one. That we observe. We have big dogs and we have little dogs. But guess what? There's still a dog, right? We have big horses. Oh, oh just jumped. My, my uh, clicker's doing some fun stuff here. Big horses and little horses. We can agree they both share a common ancestor. All right? But there's still horses. See, I don't want you to tell me about cats and dogs. I want to see the dats and the cogs. Where's the in-betweens? So microevolution isn't enough. Okay. So here is Richard Dawkins. I mentioned earlier his book, The God Delusion, uh, when we talked about atheists, The God Delusion. Here's another book of his that I have in my library called The Greatest Show on Earth, 2009. Uh, he lists in there the main arguments for evolution. He gives it as one of the world's leading atheists and, and uh, uh, evolutionists. He says, poor designs. He follows Darwin in this. Poor designs arguing against a designer, biogeography, vestigial structures, we'll talk about some of this stuff, the fossil record, and homology. We're gonna, we'll define some of that as we go. But he gives those as his main arguments for evolution. Let me list them out this way. Biogeography is the distribution of plants and animals across the world. We can look and say, okay, there's a lot of marsupials in Africa. What's a marsupial? Somebody tell me. Uh, that's an example of one, but what's, what is a marsupial? Yeah, they're primates, but what makes them marsupial? Yeah, they, they, they nurse their babies, yeah? Yes, they have the pouch, right? 
So the babies are born prematurely compared to the babies of placental mammals. And instead of just going out and kind of living on their own and getting nursed once in a while, they crawl up and climb into the pouch and they attach themselves to some teats in the pouch and they get, you know, kind of carried around and they get matured the rest of the way in the pouch. We have one marsupial in North America. It is the opossum, right? All the rest of them are down in Australia. How come all the marsupials ended up in Australia? That's the thing that biogeography tries to answer, the distribution of plants and animals. And supposedly, this is evidence for evolution. Recapitulation theory of embryology. We're going to talk about this a little bit, uh, this idea of an embryo going through its evolutionary history. The fossil record, you guys know what that is. Mocking the idea of a designer, originally called Darwin's Riddles. Nested hierarchy, that is the homology, these examples of different creatures that have similarities. So we're going to talk about each of these in turn. Those are the five best arguments for evolution. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this first one, because evolutionists will sometimes mention it, but more or less, when you start talking with evolutionists one-on-one, -on -one, or even reading the literature, the journals and stuff, they've pretty much given up on this. Here's a quote from the National Academy Press. Uh, they wrote a book called Teaching About Evolution for School Teachers. And they have pretty much given up on it. Recent books on evolution no longer give it as an argument for evolution. And for example, this teaching about evolution doesn't even mention it at all. So they've pretty much given up on it. Uh, here's a quote from 2018. It is a far from true that biogeography unambiguously supports common ancestry. So it doesn't really support evolution. Indeed, there are many tenacious problems of biogeography and paleobiogeography, that's looking at the fossils, that do not square well with evolutionary paradigm of common descent. So most of these guys have given up on it. There's lots of problems with it. They used to think it showed how all these creatures that evolved from a common ancestor kind of lived in that area together, and that kind of showed that they all evolved together, and these evolved together over here, but now there's just a lot of problems with it, and they've kind of given up on it. So I'm gonna move on from that. This one you'll still see in the textbooks, this recapitulation theory of embryology. It's the idea that as an embryo develops in its mother's womb, it goes through and reenacts these stages of its evolutionary past. And this was made popular by this guy we talked about in last session named Ernst Haeckel, the leading evolutionist in Germany. He came up with this idea of recapitulation. Now, it has been completely discredited scientifically completely discredited, and yet it's still in the textbooks. Not all of them, but many of them still have Haeckel's drawings. The latest evidence suggests that Haeckel didn't accidentally get it wrong. He purposely purported fraudulent data to try to make it look like evolution. So here is Haeckel's original drawings, and he wants to show you that all these embryos in the top row are very similar little fishy fellows. Because don't you know, we all started out as little fishy fellows. And then as the embryo develops, eventually it will become a fish, or a tortoise, or a chick, or a hog, or a calf, but it goes through these fishy stages that reenacts its evolutionary history. Now, I could never for the life of me understand when they first explained this to me, why an embryo would do that. Like, what's supposedly the, the advantage that nature would select this kind of recapitulation thing? But they argued, oh, it's great, you know, Charles Darwin, he put it in his book, Origin of the Species, and supposedly, you see these little wrinkles up there? That's evidence that we all breathe through gills once. Yes, the human embryo does have these little things, but it's just a developmental stage. The, the embryo never breathes through them. They don't breathe in the womb. They're there in the placental fluid, right? They're in water. And so, but it supposedly shows that we all have these. So it never made any sense to me. So it's just because you have some wrinkles in development, that means you came from a fish. Well, there's some guys that when they're getting older, man, they're getting the old wrinkles back. Does that mean they're turning back into a fish? I mean, what's with that? 
So it never did make any sense to me. But then it's come out that that's not even what the embryos look like. Haeckel altered the data. He, this is what they actually look like. They don't line up at any of these stages. You don't see them all look the same. Yes, there are some slight, here's the human. You can see these folds here, right? Uh, but they don't line up. They don't all look the same at any of these stages. So those pictures were fraudulent. He misrepresented the evidence. And yet here we have a 2013 science textbook, and you've got Haeckel's drawings still in there. Still in there. Ridiculous. All right, that's recapitulation. The fossil record, we're moving quickly. This one will take a little bit longer. The fossil record, we see things like extinction. We don't have lots of dinosaurs running around today. They went extinct, mostly. Intermediate forms and simple to complex. So let me give you the big picture of the fossil record. Again, I'm quoting evolutionists. This is Stephen J. Gould, Harvard University, wrote lots of books on evolution, one of the leading evolutionists in the world. And Stephen J. Gould says, I quote in his book, Panda's Thumb, all paleontologists know the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between major groups are characteristically abrupt. What's he saying? Somebody put that in your own words. What's he saying? No missing links. We have dats. We, we have cats and dogs. We don't have the dats and the cogs. We don't have the in-betweens. That's the big picture of the fossil record. Lots of species, but these gaps between them, okay? And that's the big picture. Now, we've got some exceptions, but an, a big problem for the evolutionists is this thing called the Cambrian explosion. What is the Cambrian explosion? Okay, well, it's Stephen Jay Gould. It's this problem of everything appearing abruptly in the fossil record. The fossil record has caused Darwin more grief than joy. Nothing distressed him more than the Cambrian explosion, the coincident appearance of almost all complex organic designs. So you have nothing, 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 and poof, you have a cat. Nothing, 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 poof, you have a dinosaur. Nothing, 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 poof, you've got a, a bear. You don't have something leading up to it. Oh, they'll make up stories about it. But it's this abrupt appearance. About 600 million years ago, before that, you got all this blue-green algae, and then all of a sudden, poof, you've got all these amazing different, all the major kinds of creatures appearing in an instant in the fossil record. Abrupt appearance. Here's Eugene Koonin. He's an evolutionist. He has this article, The Biological Big Bang. Uh, he says, the Cambrian explosion in animal evolution during which all the diverse body plans appear to have emerged almost in a geological instant is a highly publicized enigma. Major transitions in biological evolution show the same pattern of sudden emergence of diverse forms at a new level of complexity. Uh, he's writing in kind of gobbledygook, but what he's saying is that there's nothing, and then poof, you see these biological forms. Abrupt appearance. That's the big picture of the fossil record. And it's not supportive of Darwinism. It looks like creation. All of a sudden, these creatures appear. Secondly, the fossil record is characterized by stasis. That is, once they appear, they're pretty steady. And then maybe they might go extinct. Here's uh, uh, Niles Eldridge. He's curator of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. He's an evolutionist. He says in his book, Patterns of Evolution, it's the simple ineluctable truth that virtually all members of a biota remain basically stable with minor fluctuations throughout their duration. Somebody put it in their own words. What's he saying? You don't change kinds. Something appears, and it's pretty much minor variations. Okay, you got different colors of skin on people. You got some tall people, some but we're people. You got cats, or you got various cats. You got various dogs, but just there's, there's slight variation within the dog kind. Let's see, this is an evolutionist. It's not me saying this. You start digging in their books, and they start getting pretty honest about this. So abrupt appearance, stasis after it appears, and then gaps between the different kinds of creatures. Here's Ernst Meyer. Uh, he's an evolutionist in his book, What Evolution Is. 
he says this, given the fact of evolution, he wants to believe it's a fact, one would expect the fossils to document a gradual, steady change from ancestral forms to descendants, but that's not what the paleontologist finds. Instead, he or she finds gaps in just about every phyletic series. So they want to show slowly this evolving to that, whether it's a human evolving from an ape or whether it's you know, a, a, a horse from some primitive little deer-like creature. But instead, you've got these big gaps between the deer and the horse. It's a big gap between apes and humans. And it's a problem for the evolutionists, these gaps. Maybe I can illustrate. Let's say that modern society is completely wiped out. Maybe you have a huge pandemic, or maybe you have nuclear war or something. There's only a few survivors. And eventually, they kind of get a, a little bit of a, a rough civilization, a hunter-gatherer civilization going along. And let's just call one guy Mo and the next guy Harry. And Mo and Harry go out, and they're digging in the dirt. And all of a sudden, Mo says, hey, I found this fossil tractor thing. And they dig a little bit more, and Harry says, hey, I just found this thing called a locomotive, a fossil machine. And, and, and Mo says, you know what, Harry? I think that tractor evolved over millions of years into your locomotive. And he says, no, I don't think so. And they keep on digging, and lo and behold, they find the missing link. There it is. And it proves machine evolution. Now you laugh about it, but see, the point is you can make up a story, and maybe even you'll find something that kind of is a little bit, in some ways, maybe size-wise, it's in between, but the wheels don't look like they're following any kind of trajectory, and the engines, of course, are like completely different. You know, if anything, this, this steam engine comes ahead of, you know, some of this. Other. So, but you can make up a story about stuff like this. Okay, and that's what they're doing. That's all they're doing is making up stories. The fossils don't have dates. The fossils don't tell stories. I evolved into this, or my great-grandpa was that. They're making up stories. Now, question. And so you see shale, sandstone, limestone, and then maybe some more shale, landstone, some conglomerate and stuff. How can you tell the ages of these different things? So they'll say, well, that's a 100 million year old limestone up top, and down below, that's 600 million year old limestone. How do they know that? How do they, where do they get that from? Okay, radiometric dating does validate it, but they had this back in the Darwin's day, long before we had radiometric dating. The geologic column, yeah, that's what we're looking at, but how do they know how old that layer of limestone is and that layer of limestone and that layer of limestone? This is just limestone. It looks the same, it's just limestone. Circular reasoning, we're close, but what's the reason they give for dating those rock layers? Who said fossils? Somebody said fossils. <laughs> Somebody needs to get a gold star if we get saying fossils. We have something that's called index fossils. What's an index fossil? Okay, I got this Cambrian I'm holding up in my hot, sweaty little palm here. Uh, and this trilobite is Cambrian, okay? It's a Cambrian creature. Supposedly, this trilobite evolved in the Cambrian period about 600 million years ago. It lived and then died during the Cambrian. So therefore, if you find one of these little fellows in your backyard in a rock layer and you take it to an evolutionist, guess what they're going to say? That rock has to be 600 million years old. Well, Mr. Evolutionist, how do you know? Because the critter lived 600 million years ago. Okay, well, that's really interesting. So we date the rock layers by fossils. And then we say, well, wait a minute. How do you know that creature lived 600 million years ago? Dummy. Because it's in a rock layer that's 600 million years old. Do you see a problem with this? It's called circular reasoning. 
And a lot of times it's just plain wacko. Here is the coelacanth, lobe fin fish. At one point it was considered an index fossil for 200 roughly to 300 million years ago in the Devonian. This out of a textbook, okay? An old textbook. It was an index fossil. So if you found a rock with this odd looking lobe fin fish jobby in there, they would say that rock has to be 300 million years ago. How do you know? It's an index fossil. It means it lived just in that one period so we can index it back to 300 million years ago. Okay, they didn't find them in any of these higher layer, layers. See, they thought they went extinct 300 million years ago. And then someone who didn't know any better caught one of these things alive and kicking off the coast of South Africa. So now what does it mean about those rocks that had a coelacanth in them? Doesn't mean anything. Could have happened 10 years ago. Because the things are still alive. Yes, Dave? It is a freaky animal to have lived 300 million years, right? I mean, it's amazing. And they found a second population of them now, too, by the way, in Indonesia. So we have this circular reasoning. That's important to understand. And the evolutionists have admitted as much. Here is an evolutionist in New Scientist magazine. He says, a circular argument arises. Interpret the fossil record in terms of a particular theory of evolution. Then inspect the interpretation and note it confirms the theory. Well, it would, wouldn't it? Circular reasoning. So the fossil record is supporting evolution because you are interpreting it, assuming evolution. Here's Oxford evolutionist Mark Ridley, and he says in New Scientist Journal, in any case, no real evolutionist, whether gradualist or punctuationist, uses the fossil record as evidence in favor of evolution as opposed to special creation. So he's completely given up on the fossil record to prove evolution. Thank you very much. Completely given up on it. Okay, number four. Mocking the idea of a designer. Darwin started this. Darwin, in his book, Origin of the Species, began to make fun of creation. Because he thought, if I can knock creation and make it seem ridiculous, people will buy into evolution. And so he created something we call Darwin's Riddles. Darwin's Riddles. Stephen Jay Gould named his famous book The Panda's Thumb. Why did he name it The Panda's Thumb? Because the panda doesn't have an opposable thumb. If I asked you to pick up this stone, you would pick it up like I'm picking it up with your thumb and your fingers. But a panda would have to pick it up more like this, okay? Squeeze it. It's real hard to get a good grasp that way. My stone's falling apart. Uh, but, but his thumb operates like our other fingers, and it's not like a grasping thumb. It's more a pinching, see? So he's got a bad thumb. The evolution says he's got a bad thumb. Well, it works fine for him to, you know, get bamboo and... and um, and scrape it, it works fine for him, but they, they'll say, well, it's a bad thumb. Anybody that could make a good thumb, if a designer can make a good thumb, why do they give a bad thumb to the panda? Okay, so it's Darwin's riddles, and kind of making fun of some of the things in biology. So why would an intelligent designer make odd and curious designs that seem to be poorly engineered, like the panda's thumb? And why would a creator use different eye designs to accomplish the same task? For example, eyeballs. Uh, if you understood how to make an eyeball, why not just make all creatures with the eyeball? But you understand that we have a very different eyeball than flies, compound eyes, or trilobites. In fact, octopus have eyes that are totally different, again, wired completely differently than our eyes. So why did God have to make all these weird eyes? Like, why, why would one designer do that if he had figured out how to make eyes? And so they're making fun of God. And then why are these evolutionary leftovers, vestigial organs. Can somebody give me an example of a vestigial organ? Appendix. Appendix. Oh, yeah. It's got no use whatsoever. It's a leftover, Dino Dave. Don't you know it's a useless organ that you're carrying around? Actually, I'm not carrying it around. I had my appendix out when I was a teenager. Um, but So I'm, I'm rid of the useless organ, right? All right, so how do we answer this, these Darwin's riddles? How do we answer this? Okay, here's Stephen Jay Gould, and he's arguing in favor of evolution in his book, Panda's Thumb. Odd arrangements and funny solutions are the proof of evolution. Paths that a sensible God would never tread, but a natural process constrained by history follows per force. So this is a major argument for evolution. And Stephen Jay Gould wrote a whole book on it called The Panda's Thumb. So the interesting thing is that William Paley 
all the way back in the days of the 1800s, answered this. He answered this in his book, Natural Theology. I quote from page 30, 34, why resort to contrivance? Why make an odd little mechanism? Why have a contrived mechanism? When power is omnipotent, you can do anything. You can just make it really simple. Instead, you have this odd design. Watch what he says. Watch this. It's only by the display of contrivance, the existence, the agency, the wisdom of the deity could be testified to his rational creatures. What's Paley saying? Brilliant, brilliant statement. Let me try to illustrate. Let's say that Pastor and I are marooned on an island. We were fishing and our boat gave out and we got stuck on this island. And here we are stuck and the days go by. We're getting so sick of eating bananas and uh, you know, raw fish and stuff. And so we're like looking out there, dear God, please send somebody, you know. And all of a sudden I look out like, hey, brother, look out there. There's this bottle floating and it looks like it's got a piece of paper. Maybe it's a message. He goes, yeah, why don't you swim out and get it? I'm like, why don't you swim out and get it? And get it. So finally one of us swims out, we get it. And we bring the thing back. We're looking, okay, pop the cork and we get this message out. And it's just lines, just like straight lines. What kind of message is that? That's, that's nothing. I mean, is it a barcode? Or, I mean, what's that's nothing. But what if instead we pop it out and we look and there's little squiggles and odd little curious things and dots and, and a line. We say, Ooh, maybe it's hieroglyphics or something, but th there's a message there, right? The point is, odd things arrest our curiosity. There's a message going on. It's going, hello, hey, hey, hey. This isn't just a, you know, a, a natural thing. There's something going on over here. And we're like, oh, check that out. That's a weird thumb. Look at that panda's thumb. It's kind of, it's weird. Uh, check that out, you know. God's trying to get our attention by his designs. Yes, he could have made one kind of eyeball. But God's showing I can make lots of kinds of eyeballs. He's sending us a message. God could have made 10 stars. Look at them, aren't they pretty? No, he made billions of them just in our galaxy. He's telling us something about his power and his magnificence and his capacity. God could have made three colored flowers, blue, red, and orange. That'd be cool. Look at a blue one and a red one and an orange one. But we got thousands of variations of shades and colors and stuff like, woo, blow your mind. He's sending us a message about himself. See? That's why he does it that way. And William Paley got it long before Darwin even raised the question. Okay, well, what about vestigial organs, leftovers? For example, don't you know, Dino Dave, you have a tailbone. And that's proof that your great, 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 Harry, great, great, great grandpapa was swinging in the trees and had a tail. <laughs> Harry still does. <laughs> Turn around, Harry, let's see. Um, I like what the old fellow, he said, you know, some of my relatives may have been swinging in the trees, but they were swinging from the neck, not the tail. Uh, well, is the tailbone uh, evidence that we were once apes? No. Hey, I wouldn't mind having a tail. It'd be kind of useful, wouldn't it? Sister, we could play the piano. I mean, you could get those low notes, you know, you have an extra boom, boom, boom down. They get the bass notes, right? Boom. I mean, I could close the door behind me. I'm not even kidding. I've fallen out of trees twice in my life. I wish I had a tail. I'd like to kill myself one time. How is that a benefit, losing a tail? Never understood that. But no, your tailbone is important. It holds your whole sacral vertebrae and everything, connects everything together. You try losing it, you'd be a miserable. You can't even sit well. How about the appendix, the classic vestigial organ? It's this tiny little finger. You see that little finger there just at the very bottom of the uh, large intestine and small intestine come together there? Well, it's useless. We don't need it. It's a leftover. That's what they used to say. And then you come to find out it's not so useless after all. Recent research by evolution has shown the appendix has an important function as a safe house for helpful bacteria so that it repopulates the intestines after diseases like dysentery. So I don't have an intestine. If I ever get dysentery, I'm in big doo-doo because the appendix has dormant bacteria in there. So if you literally wash out your whole system, massive diarrhea, just get it all washed out, lose all your good bacteria, it can repopulate so you can actually digest your food. 
Uh, for me, I'll be a problem. If I can't get some yogurt or something to get some good bacteria, I'll be in a, I'll be in a stew, right? But if you got an appendix, you're, you're going to be all set. See, these things have a purpose. They may not be essential for life, but there are no vestigial organs. None. Okay, one more thing here. Nested hierarchy, the pattern of life. Now, this is actually their best argument. This is their best argument, in my opinion. It's the best they got. Homology, they say, shows common ancestry. What's homology? Okay, look at this square here. You see this five-fingered arm. Five-fingered arm. All these mammals have a five-fingered arm called a pentadactyl limb. Penta five, dactyl finger, five-fingered arm. And they're all mammals. The mole uses it for digging. A human or a monkey will use it for grabbing, manipulating. A bat is also a mammal, has the same five fingers, uses them to spread on its wing to fly with. A dolphin is also a mammal, nurses its young, has hair. It uses it for, for swimming. Well, why does a dolphin need to have five fingers in its flipper? Well, don't you know, Dino Dave, there was a common ancestor for all these mammals, and the common ancestor had a pentadactyl limb, so they all got stuck with it and had to figure out a way to use it for flying, even though birds have a much better way with feathers than the poor bat, and the dolphin has to use it, even though fish have much better ways with, 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 with uh, their uh, fins than this poor flipper on the dolphin, so all, but we have to have it because of our common ancestor, see. Now what they don't tell you is they, evolve, they, they develop from different genes. So if the common ancestor had a certain genes, how they all get different? I mean, supposedly you're stuck with the genes of your common ancestor, right? So that's a major problem, a fly in the ointment for their argument, okay? But that is their argument. Here's Charles Darwin's truly wonderful fact that all plants and animals throughout all time and space should be related to each other. How are they related? Darwin said because of homology. We can see the similarities in the design of the creatures. And so he theorized and said, if my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties must have existed. You say, well, can you give me some, Grandpa Charles? And he could say, well, keep looking, we'll find them. But he says they have to be there because we believe that they were all related. Now, follow me on this. If the fossil record showed very clear common ancestors, like we can see how this could come from just pond water and, and rocks. It's so simple, it could just come together all by itself. That would be very helpful for them. If we saw up here, gradual evolution of one kind of creature, we see all the fossils of it slowly diverging into two kinds, completely different kinds of creatures. That would be very helpful for them. If we could see transitional forms right where it branches off, that would be very helpful for them. That would be very difficult for us to explain. That is not what we see. That is not what we see in the tree of life. Rather, we see, according to Stephen Jay Gould, leading evolutionist, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, guessing, however reasonable, not the evidence of the fossils. What's Stephen Jay Gould evolutionist admitting? He's saying, we got fish and frogs and dinosaurs and horses. We don't have the in-between things. And what's this on the bottom? What's, what's that? Who knows? It's not an amoeba. It, it's something that's not preserved in the fossil record. The amoeba is still crazy complicated. You can't get an amoeba just from rocks and water. It has to be something like much simpler. See, don't know what it is. It's some kind of slime with some maybe RNA and I don't know, maybe some primitive organelle or two in there. But the amoeba still is, is really complicated. Uh, foot and everything, so it's a problem. So there's, there's, I'm illustrating in just a very crude way, but there's the evidence. Groups of creatures. And you can take this 
fossil evidence and draw a tree around it, right? Follow me, right? There's, there's the evidence. You can draw a tree around it, and that's what they do. I can take that same evidence, and I can say, no, these have always been cats, those have always been dogs, those have always been fish, those have always been hippos, those have always been elephants. It's how you interpret it. You draw a tree around it if you want. But that's not what the evidence of the fossils is actually saying. It's your interpretation. Does that make sense? Guys, that's huge. That's worth the price of mission right there. It's not the fossils, it's the interpretation of the fossils that comes up with these theories of evolution. So what about this tree of life? By the way, there was only one illustration in Charles Darwin's book, and it was a tree of life. Powerful metaphor. Been used by evolutionists all through the years to sell evolution. 2009, Graham Lawton, New Scientist magazine, an evolutionist, writes a bombshell. I love it. For a long time, the holy grail was to build a tree of life, says Eric Batiste, evolutionary biologist at Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris, France. A few years ago, it looked as though the grail was within reach, but today, the project lies in tatters, torn to pieces by an onslaught of negative evidence. Many biologists now argue the tree concept is obsolete and needs to be discarded. Discarded. A sad state of affairs. Why did God design things in groups, reptiles, mammals? Why did he have this pentadactyl limb? The Biotic Message is a great book, kind of technical, but the idea is God is sending a message that there's one designer and he has a plan. It's not multiple designers, multiple gods randomly creating things. It's one God, one person that's making all these creatures and they're tied together in groups. So there's a plan, there's coherence, there's a message, the biotic message. Okay, before we jump into transitional creatures, let's stand up. Everybody stand up, stretch, get a breath of fresh air. You guys are doing good to stay awake after a big meal like that on a late Saturday evening. But let's just take a quick stretcher. Okay, everybody sit back down again. A little bit more, we'll be done. Yeah. Yeah, the big tree of life, right? It's still out there. It's in the textbooks. But in the science journals, the, the rumblings are growing louder and louder. We've got to give up on this thing. I could give you a lot more quotes. It's getting worse. Okay. When you say something like, there are no transitional forms, the evolutionists say, oh, yes, there are. Well, no, they're not. The big picture is there's no transitional forms. Oh, well, we've got some problems, but we've got some very clear transitional forms. One creature evolving to another. Oh, yeah? Give me an example. Well, we've got Archaeopteryx and Tiktaalik and the horse sequence and the whale intermediates. They give you the same ones over and over and over again. It's like that's all you got out of the millions of fossils. You're going to argue about the same four all over again? Oh, and human evolution, which we'll talk about tomorrow morning. That's the ones they keep talking about again and again and again. And. All right. That's the exceptions that prove the rule. But let's talk about these four. Archaeopteryx. What is Archaeopteryx? Well, Archaeopteryx is a weird bird. Okay? It's a weird bird. But it's a bird. It's got fully formed perching claws. But it's, it's, it's a weird bird in that it has a true tail. Most birds don't have a tail. They have tail feathers that extend out. This one has a true tail, caudal vertebrae that go down and the feathers come off of it. It also has teeth in the beak. Kind of weird. A bird with teeth in the beak. And it has these claws on its wings. And the evolutionists going all the way back to Huxley will say, the Archaeopteryx is turning from a dinosaur into a bird. It's the transitional form right there. It's half and half. Okay, well, how do we respond to that? Here's Alan Fiducia. He's an evolutionist, and he says, paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur. It's not. It is a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleo babble is going to change that. So granted, it's got some odd features, but it's still a fully formed bird with fully formed feathers. By the way, the modern structure of the feathers of Archaeopteryx, their organization, is like an airfoil. 
typically bird-like. It's not halfway to being able to fly or partway. It is full-on bird. They're desperate to try to find something between dinosaurs and birds to prove this evolutionary linkage. So desperate that the National Geographic grabbed hold of this fossil from China, from the remote Liaoning province, an unusual dinosaur fossil made its mysterious journey into the hands of Chinese smugglers to the polished halls of the National Geographic, maybe remembered as modern paleontology's greatest embarrassment. Turns out it was a fraud. And National Geographic ran with it, front page. They were so desperate to find this link between dinosaurs and birds. So, I mean, Archaeopteryx is a bird, and they, they have a lot of speculation about this, but there is no clear intermediates. Long before a bird gets a useful wing, he's going to have a useless half wing where you can't fly, you can't even run good, and natural selection is going to select against him. See? And so, it's a problem. Well, what about Tiktaalik? Isn't that a missing link? Isn't he half fish and half a tetrapod, lizard, you know, crawling around on land? Uh, it's called a fishapod. Many evolutionists are the best example of a missing link between swimming fish and walking amphibians, tetrapods, but it's merely a flat-headed specialized fish. This is a fish. It's kind of a weird fish, but we have fish that have some of these same features today. Uh, there's fish today that can walk around, like this hand fish. He walks up on shore a little bit and goes back and he's a fish. And we have fossils in Poland that the evolutionists themselves date 10, mere, 10 million years earlier than Tiktaalik. So if Tiktaalik is the first kind of fishy fellow that's walking up on land to kind of try you know, his life on land, that eventually is going to become a reptile and humans and everything. How come 10 million years ago we got something walking around on land? Doesn't make sense. So it's bad. Horse evolution. Almost every textbook on evolution shows this horse sequence. Where is this horse sequence displayed? I'm glad you asked. It's displayed at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And thousands and thousands and thousands of visitors have gone through this and seen this little deer-like creature and then this slightly small horse, kind of a donkey fellow, and then an equine, and then the full-on equius, the full horse here. Uh, and people are like, whoa, what? evolution had to happen. Look, they got all the pieces all the way on up through. Now, the story always had problems. So some of these guys were in the same rock layer as those guys. They lived at the same time, and yet they put them in a lineage like that. And so ev creationists always said, there's issues with this. There's problems with this. Well, Niles Eldridge is the curator of the American Museum of Natural History, and he said, those textbook pictures are lamentable. It's a classical case of paleontologic museology. So he poo-pooed it all along. But they don't have a lot to go on, so they ran with this, and it's still in the textbooks. Three weeks ago, I was at the American Museum of Natural History, and I went to the horse display. And guess what? They changed it. I love it. They have a new sign up, a textbook case revisited. And they explain, they still have it, they still have it, but they explain that the evidence is a little more complicated than they've been letting on. And that there's a lot of other fossil horses in behind that they're now showing and saying, um, maybe it wasn't as simple as we said after all. They've given up on their own display. Just happened. Love it. How about, by the way, it's still in the textbooks. Um, how about whales? Don't you know, Dino Dave, there was a cow. And the cow got a little too close to the ocean one day, and boop, he fell in. Oh, poor cow. And, but he evolved into a whale and started swimming around, and it was, it was okay. Uh, just imagine whales walking around. It's true. This is textbooks, right? They say whales were once, I don't know if it was a cow, but some kind of a land creature, mammal of some kind. How do they know? Well, I know, Dave, there's these vestigial leg bones. You see those tiny little bones up to the pelvis and the leg bones? Well, they don't need them today because they're not walking around. But at one time they were walking around and now they have just a little tiny shrunken leftovers because they once were creatures that walked around and they fell into the water and they went back into the water. That's why they're mammals, but they're in the water. See? And that vestigial, that proves it. And we even have some of the missing links that kind of show this uh, supposed transition. Well, 
Welcome 2014. Whale sex, it's all about the hips. New whale research has turned a long accepted evolutionary theory on its hips. Instead of being just vestigial, whale pelvic bones play a key role in reproduction according to a new study, no hip bones, no baby whales. Uh, we were in a mixed audience here, and I want to be discreet about this, but there are certain anatomical parts of the whale that are held in certain positions during reproduction. And it's very important or you're not going to have baby whales. It's not vestigial, it's critical for life as a whale. And they're just finding this out. Oops, right. So Encyclopedia Britannica 2016, the evolutionary origin of whales remains controversial amongst zoologists. Now my friends, that doesn't stop them from telling stories. You can make up stories all day long. Well, I'll give you a story, you want a story? Here's a story. Here's clouds. Clouds are 99% H2O, water. Over here we have watermelons. Watermelons are 92% H2O water. Therefore, the cloud and the watermelon share a common ancestor. Well, that's my idea of evolution. You don't like it? See, they're just making up stories. That's all it is. Don't get intimidated by it. They'll change their tune in a few years. Here's Dr. Colin Patterson. He is senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History. He's got tens of thousands of fossils in his collection there at the British Museum of Natural History. He says, I quote, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. He wrote a book on evolution. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly include them. I will lay on the line, there is not one such fossil. None. None. That's it, that's their best arguments. We're gonna to touch real quickly on biological complexity and mechanism challenges will be done. Biology is crazy complicated. Somebody mentioned the amoeba. You can get the smallest single-celled bacterium and it is ridiculously complex. There's no such thing as simple life. There isn't. It's like a city with superhighways and information libraries and garbage disposal and energy production and uh, duplication machinery and transportation systems are carrying all this stuff around. The organelles, the simplest life at a microscopic level is crazy complicated. We still don't even understand it. We can't make life in the laboratory. But you're telling me it happened out there with just rocks and water and lightning? It's, it's, it's absurd to say this. Your chromosomes, the DNA in one person, if all your chromosomes were lined up, they could go back and forth to the moon 100,000 times. That's how much information it takes to make a you. That's your recipe. And yet it all could fit in a teaspoon. Unbelievable, tiny nanotechnology in the cells. And you're going to tell me that this long DNA molecule that can go back and forth to the moon and all the critical cellular control kits and the DNA markers and the RNA that can do the replication, the ribosomal machinery, the precise enzymes that time all this stuff all came together in some little pond all by chance, bloop, and formed a cell. I don't have enough faith to believe something crazy like that. I, I just don't. I'm sorry. It's just ridiculous. It's like thinking the monkeys, just by typing randomly on keyboards, they're going to type all the works of Shakespeare. Just give them some time. In fact, Huxley used this in one of his debates. He says, well, if you give them enough typewriters and enough time, they'll type all the works of Shakespeare. No, that's baloney. That's not science. That's ridiculous. Long before you get even a sentence, they'll destroy all the typewriters or all the word processors, right? It's just not going to happen. 1991, John Horgan, a staff writer for Scientific America, leading secular journal, wanted to write an article titled, Psst, don't tell the creationists, but scientists don't have a clue how life began. But the editor would not accept the title. Two decades later, the editor was gone, and he used it in an updated article in 2011. The fact the situation had not changed after 20 years of intense research speaks volumes about the origin of life. They cannot form life from raw chemistry. It's ridiculous. The transformation into a primitive living cell capable of further evolution appears to require overcoming an information hurdle, super astronomical proportions, an event that could not have happened within the time frame of Earth, except we believe as a 
miracle. Wow. This is 2018, my friends. A science journal. Talking about miracles. Who would have thunk? People come and say, well, Dino Dave, don't they make life in the laboratory? No. No, we can't. I win millions of dollars and really smart people smarter than me, they can't do it. Oh, they can boil some water and they add some methane and hydrogen and they spark it and then they add some uh, cooling and condense it and then some red goo collects down in, the, in, in that area down there that has some amino acids in it. What's an amino acid? Well, it's just a complicated molecule that's just laying there. Blah. But if you could get this amino acid and join it in a long chain and fold it just right, which requires a cell to do, then you might get a tiny little part a protein, which then has to be combined with a bunch of other proteins to make a machine, which you got gazillion machines in the cell. You see how far we are from it? It's like finding a square stone and saying, oh, there's a square stone. Now I understand how Notre Dame Cathedral could be blown together in a tornado. You just found a square stone. No way. If you did have life and you put it in that environment, you boil it and you spark it, what are you going to do to it? You're going to kill it. It can't even survive in that. That's the best they got. Life is ridiculously complex. If all you need was all the pieces and parts, I could put a frog in a blender, blend it up real good, and just leave it there and reform a frog, right? It's not going to happen. It's going to turn into a gooey mess and a really unhappy frog. Yet you read things in textbooks like this. This is 2014. In Darwin's warm little pond, the famous prebiotic soup. The prebiotic soup would contain organic building blocks dissolved in water. Here, here's another textbook, zoology textbook, 2014. The early organic molecules accumulated in the primitive oceans to form a hot, dilute soup. They keep talking about this soup, 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 soup. In this primordial broth, all this stuff, this carbohydrates and fats and all that, in the soup. Here's ecology textbook. Recently, it's been suggested that hydrothermal vents are a potential site for the origin of life. Vent water may be the ultimate soup in the sorcerer's kettle. Soup, 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 soup. I'm waiting for Campbell's to come out with primordial soup, and there will be your great-grandfather right there in the can. <laughs> soup. No, 1860s, a guy by the name of Louis Pasteur, a Christian, by the way, conducted this famous scientific disproof of spontaneous generation and establishing the law of biogenesis. What's the law of biogenesis? Life begets life. Non-life never becomes life. Only life begets life. No known exceptions. Basically kills off the whole Darwinian story of goo to you via the zoo. Because if you need a creator to get the first life started, they might as well just make the various kinds of creatures. And then we have complex biological systems, not just the cell, but you, all these crazy, beautiful organs like the eyeball. Darwin himself said, to suppose the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. He said this in his book. Yet he tried to go on and show how it could maybe have happened, and, and it's just absurd. As he says, the retina of your eye in less than two square inches is 100 million light-sensitive receptor cells. We talked about the complexity of one cell, 100 million of them, just in your retina, less than two inches. The psalmist says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Modern science just confirms that a thousand times. Biological complexity. Uh, an illustration of biological complexity is the mousetrap. I have here a working, functioning mousetrap. I'm going to set this mousetrap. Don't try this at home. I'm a highly trained scientist for this experiment here. I'm going to try not to hurt myself or anybody in the audience. I'm going to set this mousetrap. There we go. I just set it. Don't be intimidated. I know what I'm doing. Here we see this mousetrap, and it has these six pieces, the hammer, the catch, the bait, the spring, the base, and the holding bar. Question, if I were to take away one of those pieces, how many mice would I catch? Will I catch five-sixths as many mice? You're shaking your head no, Josiah. Why? It won't work. It has to all be present, or you're going to get exactly zero mice. Now follow me. 
what good is one sixth of the way to having a tail, or one sixth of the way toward having an eyeball, or one sixth of the way towards a, a wing, or a blood clotting system, or any of the other zillions of complicated systems that we have. There is no advantage unless all the pieces are in place at the exact right place at the exact same time. Nature can't see it to select it if it's not yet seeing. It's just a soft spot it's going to actually be selected against because it's more prone to injury and useless. And so a bacteria, single-celled, has on the back of it a flagellum. I'm going to show you an animation of this in just a minute. The flagellum turns, it's an outboard engine, and it moves the bacteria so it can eat all the nutrients here and then move through the liquid to someplace else and eat some. It's essential for it to move. It's made up of 40 proteins, all of them essential, like the six pieces of a mousetrap. Anyone missing, you got a dead bacterium. Ain't gonna, ain't gonna move. It's so tiny that eight million of them could fit across a human hair, and yet we recognize all these pieces under the microscope. We say, hey, there's a rotor, a stator, there's bearing, there's a hook joints. We know them because we build outdoor outboard engines. It's an outboard engine. But let me tell you, we can't build outboard engines like the one God built. This thing runs at 100,000 RPM. Now, some of you guys that know cars, I'm not good with cars. Tell me what would happen if I were to take my car engine and rev it to 100,000 RPM. Goodbye motor, right? Meltdown. Jet engines run at 100,000 RPM. But this will do what a jet engine can't do. This thing will stop and change directions in a quarter of a turn. Try doing that with a jet engine while it's in flight. Unbelievable complexity. Look at this thing. It's just spinning and it's moving that bacterium. And we recognize the rotors and the stators and we recognize all the pieces because we build outboard engines. Yet if there's one piece missing, it ain't gonna happen. It's not going anywhere. Now my friends, this is 2017 Science Magazine, a secular journal, and notice what they say. The bacteria flagellum exemplifies a system where even small deviations from the highly regulated flagellar assembly process can abolish motility and cause negative physiological outcomes. What are they saying? Somebody put that in a human language. One piece is missing, it won't work. Why couldn't he just write that? <laughs> well, he's a doctorate, you know, and then people might understand that, hey, there's a problem here for evolution. Uh, no, it's, it's, this is good. I mean, we're making some progress. 2017, okay. So biological complexity. Finally, mechanism challenges. Mechanism challenges. Natural selection makes a nice story. It does. It made a nice story for Darwin. It's gotten a lot of traction. But it does not create anything new. It doesn't. Nature, if it sees something that has a tremendous advantage, can select it in that it's going to out-survive other things. Nature's not a person selecting. It just out-survives other things, and it passes more genes, and eventually the whole population becomes more like that one that was successful. It's like quality control in a factory. If you're doing quality control and widgets are coming down, and you see one that's bad, you pull it out, and you say, that one needs to get re you know, refurbished or thrown away. Okay, good, 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 good. Oh, oh, there's a problem. And so it's weeding out mistakes. Now, if you're in a factory, let's say you're making um, lawnmowers, and you're watching them come through, and you kind of examine them, okay, looks good, looks good, looks good. How many years before that process, that you're, what you're doing is going to create a Boeing 747? That's all that natural selection does. It just picks out the monsters, see? It doesn't create anything. Nothing new is getting created. It's a good story, but that's all it does is weed out the monsters. You say, survival of the fittest, Dave. Really? You mean to tell me that fish down there is more fit than the ones up there? Uh, maybe we should say survival of the luckiest. Nature's got a lot of stuff going on. I mean, there's hurricanes and trees fall and, and one fox happens to go where the rabbit was and was it the most fit fox? Who knows? He just happened to, you know, he got dinner that night. So there's lots of stuff going on. And so you have a small, tiny mutation Nature's not even going to see it amongst all the stuff that happens in life. The, the mechanism is fundamentally flawed. And God addresses this in Ecclesiastes. He says, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle of the strong, nor yet favor to the man of skill, but time and chance happens to all of them. So it's unpredictable. 
Number, number two, even if natural selection was up to the job, there have been no documented mutations that add new information to the genome so they could be selected. We have been looking and looking and looking and done experiments after experiments. We have never seen new information added to the genome. It's like me saying, some of you guys are old like me, I'm going to date myself right now, I have a DOS computer. And I'm just going to go in, I'm randomly going to change some ones to zeros and zeros to ones and just delete some stuff and throw some stuff in there and then try to run it and see if I can get Windows, you know, 10. It's never going to happen. Never. Information requires intelligence. Random changes only destroy information. We have never observed new information in a genome. We observe uh, destruction of information. We observe two-headed turtles, reshuffling of information. Here's Werner Gitt. He is the director of the German Federal Institute of Physics. He says, information only arises through an intentional, volitional act. There's no known natural law through which matter can give rise to information. Neither is there any physical process or material phenomenon known that can do this. So all the best arguments the evolutionists have have major problems. The complexity is a major problem. And information that can be the basis of new systems is a problem. Here is Alan Shapiro, an evolutionist. He says, as many biologists have argued since the 19th century, random changes would overwhelmingly tend to degrade intricate organized systems rather than adapt them to new functions. That's it. That's the truth right there. He's an evolutionist. It's a major problem, and he's acknowledging it. Well, I want to wrap things up tonight by taking you back to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter, this old crusty fisherman, makes a prophecy and says, in the end times, there's going to be a lot of skeptics. And the skeptics are going to say, ah, where's the promise of Christ coming? Everything's just continued for many, 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 many years. Just uniformitarianism. That's what they're going to say. Sure enough, the other's saying it. But then he gives their motivation. Why would they say something like this? We've talked about the problems with evolution. Why do they cling to this still? That's the reason why. The reason why people don't want to believe Christ is coming again, and it's because, as he says in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, the earth shall be burned up. This is all going down. All the stuff in our house that we have carefully assembled, our bodies that we try to hold together with lotions and this and that, and the other, it's, all, it's all going down. It's all going down. It's all getting burned up. So let's talk about what happens afterwards. If you were to die today, where would you go? You're going to go back to the Creator. You're going to give an account. You could stand before him tonight. I've got no guarantees. I could die tonight in my sleep. It could be done. It's maybe my last day. Last talk for Dino Dave. Stand before God. Give an account. Are you ready for that? Don't ever buy into the lie that's not a God. Absolutely, there is a God. He made you. He's got a purpose for your life. He loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. And he wants to have a relationship with you. You believe that? That's Bible, my friends. Maybe you don't know where you're going to spend eternity. The single best thing we could settle tonight is not the bacteria flagellum, all the problems in the fossil record for the evolutionists, or even some cool books on dinosaurs. The best thing we could do tonight would be to settle that you're ready for eternity. 1 John 5.13 says, These things are written that you might know you have eternal life. Do you know you have eternal life? If you don't, please come talk to me. Talk to pastor. Talk to somebody tonight. Because that's the most important knowledge you could possibly have. Let's close in prayer. God in heaven, we've tried to lift you up as a great creator. But God, that's not enough for us to understand, okay, there's a creator. That is only step one. We then have to acknowledge that we are accountable to that creator who made us and be prepared to meet him. 
For the Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. So, Lord, I pray if there's any one of my friends in here tonight that isn't prepared to meet you, that they would take the time tonight to sit down with us, that we might go from the Word of God, not based on our authority, but the authority of the Word of God, and show them how they can know for sure they have eternal life. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pastor.